Ackerman and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today to discuss the ways in which federal infrastructure policy can help mitigate and adapt to climate change. My name is Whitley Salmweber, and I currently serve as the director of the Stevenson Ocean Security Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. This project is a new effort on behalf of CSIS to examine the links between ocean health, marine resource conflicts, and national security challenges. Prior to joining CSIS, I held appointments as a visiting fellow at Stanford University and as Associate Director for Ocean and Coastal Policy in President Obama's White House Council on Environmental Quality. I have previously worked for the late Senator Dan Inouye and at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration as an advisor to the two previous administrators. Over the course of my career, I've helped to develop, implement, and lead our national ocean, Arctic, and fisheries policies, and is this experience that my testimony today draws upon. The second volume of the fourth National Climate Assessment issued late last year makes it clear that the impacts of climate change are being felt now and absent significant changes to the global carbon economy will be accelerating into the foreseeable future. Climate change therefore serves as both the source of immediate challenge and strategic risk. Managing this risk will require a combination of near-term investments to adapt existing infrastructure and a sustained commitment to developing more resilient systems in the face of continuous change. The U.S. marine transportation system provides for 90 percent of our imported goods, supports $4.6 trillion in economic activity, roughly a quarter of our economy, and sustains 23 million jobs. All of these are at risk if we do not provide appropriate investments to ensure resilience in our maritime infrastructure and to do so in a way that accounts equally for economic, environmental, and social values. The U.S. Committee on the Marine Transportation System has identified three primary risks to the MTS associated with climate change, sea level rise, increasing frequency and potency of coastal storms, and the opening of the Arctic. They also identify an additional 29 environmental factors that may be exacerbated by climate-related impacts and which would put maritime infrastructure at further risk. These include such diverse threats as invasive species, extreme events, and changing migration patterns. In considering how to respond to such a complicated array of risk factors, we should be clear in how we prioritize the impacts based on likelihood of threat and the value of the infrastructure at risk. But we should also think about how we define resilience and what we wish our goals to be. The National Academies of Science has defined resilience as the ability to prepare, resist, recover, and more successfully adapt to the impacts of adverse events. This is sufficient so long as we believe that we have a clear sense of what the possible range of those events may be. But the current reality of climate change is that our world is not in steady state. Rather, we exist in a state of continuous change. We should therefore recognize that today's standards will be insufficient to meet tomorrow's needs just as last year's 100-year flood is this year's hurricane season. Sea level rise is a great example of this dynamic as it is uh, both accelerating and variable across geographies. But these changes will apply in our communities as well, and when considering investments in port infrastructure, we should understand that the nature of regional maritime industries are likely to change as climate drives changes in regional economies, global shipping patterns, and national security challenges. Among the most clear example of these ships will be in the Arctic, where we may see an ice-free pole within the next 10 to 20 years. This has tremendous implications for economic development, resource exploitation, shipping routes, and strategic challenges. Meeting these needs will require us to consider the level of investment we are currently making and commit to providing the resources needed to uh, support our national security and sustainable economic development in a new ocean. Moving forward, I commend the committee for considering climate impacts in its deliberations and recommend the following priorities. For general maritime infrastructure needs, the U.S. Coast Guard, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and NOAA should jointly lead a comprehensive assessment of U.S. port infrastructure and its risk to climate-related hazards. Each of these agencies have a number of programs on which such an effort could build. Individual port needs will vary widely, but investments in communication networks for immediate hazard adaptation and contingency planning and land use planning to optimize use of green gray infrastructure for long-term resilience should also be priorities. And finally, investing in Arctic capabilities for the U.S. Coast Guard and related mission capacity should be a priority. This includes fully supporting the Polar Security Cutter Program, investing in communication and vessel monitoring networks to support implementation of the Bering Strait Port Access Route Study, supporting implementation of the Alaskan Arctic PARs in the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas, and providing for engagement with Alaska Native communities and governments on the development of a deep water port facility in the Bering Strait region and moving forward with its development based on this input and the outcomes of the forthcoming U.S. Army Corps of Engineers study. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions and discussion. Thank you for your testimony.